Hello, College Chemistry 1. Uh, this is our first chapter for, um, for our chemistry journey. Uh, this is the beginning of a two-semester course. Um, this is Chemistry 201. The next one will be Chemistry 202. Chapter 1, Chemical Foundations. Okay. In this chapter, well, before uh, I start lecturing on, on, on Chapter 1, I would like to say that, uh, well, chemistry is, uh, is the intersection. I mean, it's kind of like the middle track of all the sciences. As we know, sciences can be divided or separated into biology, um, chemistry, physics, those are the natural sciences. But we also have mathematics, right, which is also a science. We have even computer science. We have geographic information systems, which are also, a sci is also sciences. We have geology. They have many, uh, sorry, uh, geosciences. So different sciences, they have their own characteristics. In the case of chemistry, chemistry could be defined as the science that studies the matter, the properties, and the changes of that matter. Okay? So <clears throat> it's really, a, I would, myself, I, I describe it as kind of like an intermediate between biology and physics. Physics, one of the main aspects of physics is that it covers the, the really atomic part of the matter. So they deal with properties of electrons, protons, neutrons. We do that in chemistry, but in physics, they do it way deeper. What happens in biology? They don't go to the, those small particles. What, they, what within biology do, they talk about cells, they talk about organisms, they talk about plants, animals. Right? So it's like a ma macro system, and the, for physics, we the nano ecosystem as we will see later on. So it's two, two sides, biophysics and chemistry is in the middle. So chemistry really has a little bit of physics, a little bit of biology. We need a lot of math. Um, we at some point we also need statistics, um, but very, very general. So as we continue with the chapters, we will see like how all these disciplines intersect. So mostly in general, general chemistry course. Similar things you will see in general physics, general bio. But I would say that in chemistry, you get really a taste of all the sciences. You get, you will see chapters that are very, very I mean, strongly associated with physics, later on about atomic structure. In biology, when we do some organic chemistry, when we do um, acid and bases, later on, definitely those topics are gonna be, you will see how everything blends. And, and they all have a similar, uh, similar structure. They are all natural sciences. Okay. So let's start with a chemistry overview. Uh, we're gonna study, as we say, that, that chemistry studies the matter and the properties and changes. So what is, what is matter? Matter is composed of very tiny particles called atoms. Well, there was a scientist that he said, uh, <clears throat> as we will see later on in chapter number two, if you divide your, let's say, a piece of bread to the tiniest, tiniest species that you can divide, divide it, like cut it, cut it, cut it, cut it, and the smallest, it can be called atom. And so the atom is the smallest entity of matter that we can find. But we will say like, oh, but in high school or somewhere else, I heard that, that atom can also be divided into neutrons, protons, and electrons. Yes, they can also be divided, but they don't have an identity. You know, for example, we cannot say like an, an electron is an element, right? Why? Because it's really a group of elements, a group of electrons will really make it the element. So the smallest particle that has that identity is called an atom. Atom can be divided later on, but those will be fragments. It's like, for example, you have a, a, a glass of uh, a glass, right? A glass is the smallest thing that you can for, for drinking, right? Let's say, or like a shot glass, right? So it's the smallest thing for drinking, but what happens if you like break it? Yeah, you have pieces of glass, but they don't really, they're part of one single identity, which is the, the glass, right? So the tiniest particles are called atoms. Um, there's nothing else that can be divided with an identity, right? So, <clears throat> The molecule, it comes from the association of two or more atoms joined, uh, as we can see in here, right? So here you have oxygen atom and we have here hydrogen atom. Yep. So the water molecule, uh, it is, uh, is, is, comes from the association of these, 
these atoms, right? So in this case, we are using two atoms of oxygen uh, of hydrogen and one atom of, uh, of sorry, two atoms of hydrogen and one atom of oxygen to form the water molecule. And so that's that's something that we call a chemical reaction. We will see later that we can tie up some atoms to form a molecule. Molecules can be divided, yes. Molecules, if you divide molecules, definitely you will go back to atoms, right? So you got for molecule, it goes back to atoms, and then atoms can also go to form molecules. Uh, is that simple, that, that two atoms, they decide to get together to form a molecule? No, there are some affinities. Not every random atom, right, is gonna form a molecule with another random atom. So there are some rules uh, that allows you to make molecules. So you cannot just take any random, uh, let's say like, oh, I wanna take hydrogen and then connect it with helium, let's say. Like, no, it's not, it's not as simple as that. And so all those, uh, all those properties or characteristics, we will learn it along the way on the, in this course. So a chemical reaction, right? That's also was part of the definition of, of, of chemistry that studies the matter, the properties, and the changes. So in a chemical reaction, what we do is we break bonds and we form new bonds. Right? So for example, in this case, we have two water molecules. So the water molecules are right here, right? So what we do is now we are breaking these bonds. We break this bond and also this bond here. This bond gets broken, this bond gets broken to form hydrogen, uh, hydrogen molecules, in this case, hydrogen molecules. Okay. And then here, an oxygen molecule. Okay. So a, re a chemical reaction can be understood as the process or an event in which uh, as a, a matter or a substance or, a, or something, right, uh, breaks bonds, right, a molecule or, or an anything really can be a atoms or molecule and in the case of molecule you break bonds and you form new bonds and so it's a transition uh, what is what is the the size of chemical reaction since chemical reactions most of the time is like by they absorb or release energy there is a color change and there is also a formation of a solid a precipitate they say that you are mixing two two clear solutions, right? So two clear solution and then you mix them up and then you get a white solid, a white precipitate or a yellow precipitate. So what is that? That's a sign of a, of, of a chemical reaction. Same thing with gas evolution. If you produce gas, that's also a, a sign of a chemical reaction. And so for now, let's just stick to the idea that a chemical reaction is just a, is a change that you change from one way to another way. And then in that process, right? So for example, you have a species A, in this case, in, in this case, we have water molecules, right? We're going from water to oxygen molecules and also hydrogen, hydrogen molecules. And so the process where you are breaking bonds and form new bonds. Can I just break bonds or do I have always to four bonds? Uh, you can also break only that. Yeah. So it involves the, the cleavage and the formation and or the formation of new bonds. What about science? Uh, okay, so since we just went over the, the definition of chemistry, now about science is, is I mean, it's a domain, it's a study of all the phenomena that happens in, in, the, in our Earth. I mean, now, is, now with the development of this exploratory, right, of the universe, the exploration of the universe, uh, that passion is increasing now. It's not only about the, the science in the in Earth, so it's also going to other to other planets, to other, to other bodies that exist in the universe. So we're always trying to investigate what is around us and then how can we maybe adjust some conditions to our benefit. And so anything that we're doing in science, let's say like right now uh, for medicine, pharmaceuticals, everything, we're trying to, to come up with new alternatives using those tools, what nature is providing us to, to definitely take, uh, get a better, better uh, life quality. So <clears throat> what happens when, when science, I mean, okay, I'm a scientist, for example, in my case, I'm a chemist. Um, how did I, for example, how do I start something? So if you want to be a scientist, what is the procedure? 
So is it the same thing that an accountant is going to be doing or what a lawyer is going to be doing, like a doctor? It's a little bit similar to the doctor. So one is medical sciences and the, uh, for us is natural sciences. So we always have what we call a scientific method. The scientific method is a, is a is series, it's different steps uh, that we as scientists, we always go through. For example, in my case, to get my diploma, I had to write a dissertation and also present it. That particular project, which was my dissertation, that at some point, most of you will also have to write a dissertation, right? So for bachelor's degree, for master's, or whatever you want to do, I mean, doctorate as well. So you have to always to go through the scientific method. This scientific method has different steps. The first one is the observation. In the observation part, what you have to do is just ex start to explore. You have to frame your question. And so I would say like, okay, so I want to be a doctor. I would like to know why, uh, let's say like hepatitis, uh, normally patients with hepatitis, they have like a yellow color in their bodies. Right? So that the skin tone is normally yellow and even the eyeballs turn yellow. I would like to know how is the liver related to that. Right? So, or how can I, because normally, well, somebody has hepatitis, definitely you don't want to walk on the streets having that yellow tan, right, on your skin. So everybody's gonna be looking at you. So as a scientist, maybe, maybe as, a, as, a, as a biologist or like a medical scientist, I would like to know how can I maybe come up with a drug or a medication that could help to attenuate that particular yellow tan, right? So I don't want my patient to be embarrassed and then, but first of all, I mean, you have hepatitis, definitely you have to stay at home, right? But in the case that you have to be seen by people, why I don't want to have that yellow color. So that's the observation. I identify my problem. The problem is this. So this is the, the, the question I want to answer. Then the comes the hypothesis after that part is the hypothesis. Then you wonder, okay, so hepatitis, what happens in hepatitis? There is a liver problem. Okay, so what happens with the liver? Well, there is a virus that it is infecting the liver, and maybe that particular, that's my hypothesis, maybe that particular virus is releasing some toxins that have some like uh, effect on the skin. So that's what I'm thinking, that's my hypothesis. So I'm gonna be thinking, okay, so I wanna target that particular molecule that is secreted by, my, by the liver that creates that yellow color on the skin. That's my hypothesis. There is a molecule. I don't know what molecule it is yet, but I, I'm assuming, I'm hypothesizing that it is something. It's a, it's a molecule that is producing that yellow, yellow tan. Then you start doing experiments. Then that's the next step, you start doing experiments. Then what you will do, for example, you will take some biopsy some, uh, of infected liver, and you will start taking apart, I mean, some, some fragments like, okay, so I have this liver tissue, I'm going to be uh, doing some sampling, right? Some samples of the, of the molecule, maybe some of them might have some reaction on the skin. So I will separate molecule A, molecule B, molecule C, molecule D, and then I will start doing experiments. Do they have an effect? So let's say I'm gonna put it on some skin, uh, skin cells, right? So <clears throat> skin cells, and then I put that particular molecule from, that is produced by the liver and see if that skin gets a yellow color. So maybe for molecule A didn't work, for molecule B didn't work, C doesn't work. And this is the circle as, as you see here on, the present, on this slide, it goes in circles. So the experiments really recycle and then you change your observation. Okay? So you can even rephrase your hypothesis. Let's say, oh, it's not a virus. What is really, maybe what is the hepatitis is producing is one, maybe the virus is producing a protein a protein that is being secreted by the, by the liver. Okay, then I have to rephrase my hypothesis. I cannot say it's a molecule. I would say like, okay, so a protein secreted by the liver, that infected liver by hepatitis is producing a protein, right? Is, is that protein has a skin, right? A skin, a skin coloration. And so you go back and forth between uh, observation and hypothesis uh, uh, in circles until you come up with your conclusion. Once you come up with your conclusion, let's say like I have protein A is the one that is responsible for that yellow tan. 
in the skin of my hepatitis, hep, uh, hepatitis patients. Then I will come up with a theory. Right? So the theory would say like, okay, so this protein that has this particular shape, has this particular size, has this particular components, right, is responsible for the hepatitis. It has an action on the skin, goes through the blood, and then targets the skin cells, giving that yellow coloration. Okay? So <clears throat> the theory can be also, as you can see here, it can also be rephrased. Why? Because, uh, well, we are just looking maybe at patients that have hepatitis A. Maybe patients with hepatitis B don't have the same, the same coloration. Maybe they have may, a more orange coloration. Or, or what about a patient with hepatitis C? They don't have any coloration. So you can always change your theory as with new experiments every time that, that, that is, uh, is, 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 I mean, is produced, the theory. And so it always goes in circles. It's a never, sometimes a never ending process. And then somebody could even come, let's say like my colleague from uh, the lots of teachers, uh, let's say like, or, or is working also in hepatitis. They say like, no, it's not a protein what, you, what is called causing the coloration. The protein that you discovered uh, triggers the release of a sugar and that sugar gives you the coloration. So, now my theory has to be changed. I mean, it may be the loop is not, is, I mean, the, the whole circle, the whole cycle is not completed. I only study the protein, but maybe that protein triggers the production of a sugar and the sugar has really the skin effect. I just didn't study the sugar at the beginning, but this new scientist now is studying the sugar that is produced by this protein. So see, so all always goes in circles and then you have, you have a, final, a final theory, okay? So here are some definitions for scientific models. Okay, so the first part, let's go from the beginning, observation. In the case of observation, it is when you frame or you are really hunting for a research question that you wanna answer. Okay? So for example, if you are on the street and you see the rainbow, oh, I see the rainbow, I mean that those seven colors are coming, I mean, they look so beautiful. I would like to know what causes it. That's your observation, okay? So the hypothesis is like, Okay, so I think that maybe the sun during the sunset or during the some somewhere when it rains, it is when I see the it is the there is an association between the sun and the rain that causes the rainbow on the sky. That's my hypothesis. That's what it says here. Hypothesis is a possible explanation, a possible explanation of an observation. Okay. There comes experiment, so you will go, let's say like study, if you see a rainbow, right? In a rainy day, in a dry day, in the morning, in the afternoon, at night, or at night would be very difficult to see a rainbow, but you do a series of experiment, or experiments to, to determine what causes the rainbow, how it is produced. After your conclusion, so like after doing many, many studies, I would say like, okay, my law is, right? A law is what summarizes what happens. Is like after the rainy day or a day that is has a high humidity, in the presence of the sun, a rainbow is formed. That's my my law. It's a law that I'm I'm I'm, I'm really is coming from my the conclusion of my experiments. What about the theory? The theory is a more comprehensive uh, statement. And so a law really is a summary. What do I see? Rain, sun, rainbow. That's all you have to say for law. It's very small. Okay. But in theory, no. In theory, you have to explain why it happens. And so basically what you have to say in the case of the rainbow, I would say like, well, the, the small water particles that are suspended in the air are crossed by the sunlight. And then this uh, droplet of water acts as a prism and then it decomposes the light into the seven colors of the rainbow. That's why we see a rainbow. That would be a theory. That would be the theory that explains what happens. It's not only a, a summary. So the law, that's why some people, they confuse. What is the difference between law and theory? Law is just a statement. So this, this, and this, right? A, B, and C, that's what happens. In a theory, no. Theory, you try to explain things. So you have to explain uh, why things occur and then why things do not occur. So it's not always uh, about, uh, about occurring. It can also be not occurring. So um, that's why we have the, 
atomic theory, right? And we have some physics laws, right? So as we will see later, I mean, you guys will see the Newton's law, it only says that force is equal to mass times acceleration. It's just a law. It doesn't explain anything, right? So exact Newton theory, yeah, that's different. So a theory is really an explanation of many things. So as we were saying, uh, as we were moving forward in your in your experiments, right, in your scientific scientific life, uh, definitely you have to. I mean, those experiments that you definitely need to measure something. And so because chemistry, biology, all natural sciences, they are very heavy in quantitative observation. It says here. Right? So in quantitative observation, I want to know like time, for example, mass, volumes, uh, um, distance, right? length, uh, density. There are different measurements that we have to do. For example, in the case of the hepatitis, I have to quantify the levels, like how yellow the skin right, turns. In the case of the rainbow, I would like to see um, well the intensity, how strong is a rainbow, right? Or how humid, or how much rain should be, or what time, at what time is normally rainbows occurring. So you always have to report data, and they are always somewhat quantitative. So science is heavy in quantitative observation. Right? So therefore, you are going to be conducting a lot of measurements uh, during your during your project, okay? and Anytime that you report a measurement, don't forget to always mention, well, the value, which is the number, and also the scale, the unit. So if somebody tells you, like, what, um, in how long are you going to take to come to, to, to the park? Well, I'll be there in 10. You don't get much information in 10. 10 what? 10 minutes? 10 hours? 10 seconds? Or what is it? What are you trying to say by saying 10. So you always have to say like 10 minutes. I'll be there in 10 minutes, right? So you will have to give a number, a value, and the unit. Okay? So here are some examples. How much, what is your weight? Okay, my weight is, let's say like 150. 150 what, kilograms? No, pounds. Okay, so you always have to uh, start, always mention the, the units. Okay? So in this case here, we have 6.63, 10 times the joules per second. Right? Different type of measurements. I mean, don't be afraid right now. I mean, we don't know that. Joules is a unit for energy. Joules is energy, and this is time. Okay. Grams is mass, right? So different units. Here are some, uh, the international system. SI stands for international system. It's just in a different language. That's why it's SI, but SI is international system unit. For mass, uh, it is kilograms. I know that the imperial system, right, in UK and, the, and, and also in the United States, and even, I think, Burma, right? Burma in South Asia. Yep. Uh, Burma is also having the imperial system that they use. They don't use kilograms. We use here in the United States, pounds. For length, uh, we don't use meters, right? We use uh, foot or inches. In time, seconds, yeah, well, that's a coincidence. Temperature, Kelvin, is, that's the universe, uh, that is the absolute temperature. but in some other countries, for example, in South America, uh, Celsius scale is used. And here in the United States, um, Fahrenheit, right? Fahrenheit is the temperature that's used. But in science, we're normally going to be using Kelvin. Okay? So there, there's some concept behind the Kelvin scale that, that is going to be normally is the most appropriate in science and chemistry. Electric current, ampere, amps, amps definitely are everywhere. And then, and then the mole, that's a new type of unit that maybe you guys are not familiar yet, but we do have, we do, we do use moles for chemistry quantities. Okay. Here are some prefixes used in, 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 in chemistry or in science in general. Um, why do we come up with that? Because it depends on the quantity, right? So for example, if you go to the, if, if, if you go to the market, let's say like you say like, well, please, could you just give me two pounds of, of potatoes, right? Or one pound of potatoes or, or, or onions, right? But in chemistry, you are not going, normally in a, chemi in a chemistry lab, you're never going to hear that somebody say like, please, could you give me two pounds of sodium chloride? No, no. So every environment, every setting has a different type of range of units that you, right? Range for the quantities. For example, in a lab, you're going to be normally hearing saying like, oh, can you please weigh one gram of sodium chloride? 
but you, when you go to the market, you're never going to buy one gram of sodium chloride, right, of table salt, right, or sugar, right, sugar, no, nobody buys one gram, so you buy two pounds, one pound, right, so it is normally dusty, so everything has a different type of uh, range, so that's why here we use different types of conversions, so those are really prefixes that they are really magnifying or reducing, in the next slide we will have reducing, for example here, we'll have for a smaller, deci is, uh, is one tenth, uh, centi, centimeters, for example, is 100, um, milli is 1,000, right? And then micro, 10 to the minus six. So here are the, are the unit, I mean, the conversion, basically the conversion factors to go from centi, right? To, to get to centi, milli, micro, nano. Okay? So for example, here, I'm sure that you guys are from, or have heard about giga, right? For example, gigabytes right? for, for the internet. Mega, megabytes, right? So also, how many megas are in here? Kilograms, right? Kilograms per kilo. Uh, this one is not that common to hear. A hecto, hecto, it is used for uh, area, for surfaces, right? But, I mean, here in the US, this normally is not that common, but in South America, for example, it is very common to say like the hecto, the hecto uh, uh, prefix, yep, so, uh, tera, yeah, tera can also be used, right? Normally for memory capacity of, of computers, laptops, now they go this high, 10 to the 12. Before we used to have like giga, right? How many gigas is the computer? It's 10 to the minus nine, it's the capacity. But now they're going all the way up to 10 to the 12. Yep. So to do some, some of these conversions, I'm going to, to start some explanation. Right? So for example, let's say that <clears throat> that we want to, let's say like, I want to convert 10 grams, right? 10 grams into milligrams, right? I'm, do, I'm doing the, the conversion. By the way, uh, I'm gonna, this is just a lecture, but as you guys know, the, the, I will also do some videos with some problem solving. So this is only for explanation. So from the slide, we have that milligram is 10 to the minus three. So what I have to do is one gram, right, times, I know that one milligram, right, one milligram is equal to 10 to the minus three grams, right? So now I'm gonna take advantage of that and then I will, I will create what I call a conversion factor. Conversion factor is, a, as it says, it's a factor that allows me to go from one unit to another unit. So in this case, I'm gonna go from, from milligram from grams to milligrams. My conversion factor in this case would be one milligram is equal, right? Is 10 to the minus three grams. That's one way how I can write it. But I can also write it upside down. One 10 to the minus three grams is one milligram. Right? So both both conversion factors are completely correct. So one is milligram up, grams down, grams up, milligrams down. So which one should I do here? Well, you have to choose the conversion factor that, that allows me to, to come up with the milligram uh, unit. In this case, I have grams, then I need to cancel out grams. Since my grams here at the top, I want my conversion factor that has the grams at the bottom. So this one should be the, the conversion factor I use. One milligram is 10 to the minus three grams. Okay? So grams with grams cancel out. 10, 10 to the minus, 10 divided by 10 to the minus three, that's gonna be 10 to the minus two. Sorry, it's gonna be 10 to the two. We do this calculation, 10 to the two. What am I doing? 10 divided by 10 to the minus three, that's 10 to the four, not bad. So what I'm gonna be doing here is, uh, well, 10, 10 to the minus three, right? I'm gonna do it upside down times 10, yeah, 10,000. Right? So 10,000 would be the 10 to the fourth or 10,000 milligrams would be the result for this conversion, okay? So 10 grams is equal to 10,000 milligrams. So let's use the conversion factor like in this way. Let's do another example. Okay? 
So in this, in the second example, we will have, um, now let's go higher. Let's say that like I want to do giga, right? Gigas was 10 to the, 10 to the six. Let's go, let's check. Giga was 10, no, sorry, 10 to the nine. Giga, uh, mega was 10 to the six. Yep. So, so I want to convert um, 10, let's say like 10, 10 to the four bytes, right? To megabytes. So I know that for megabytes is 10 to the, right? So one megabyte is equal to 10 to the six bytes, right? That's my conversion factor, right? Or the, the equivalence. So one mega, one megabyte divided by 10 to the six bytes, or I could say 10 to the six bytes divided by one megabyte. So those are the two different types of conversion factor I can create. Okay, so now let's go here. I want the, the bytes to be canceled out, right? Here we put my conversion factor, and then I want to get megabytes. So which of the two conversion factors should I use? Well, I want bytes to cancel out. So if bytes here is at the top, I have to use the conversion factor has the bytes at the bottom. So 10 to the six bytes, right? And then on the top is one megabyte. Bytes with bytes cancel out, so megabytes is the remaining. 10 to the fourth divided by 10 to the sixth. Uh, here we apply some math, uh, 10 to the fourth. If this one divided by 10 to the sixth, right? The power that is dividing goes to the top subtracting, right? So times 10 to the minus six. So four minus six, that will be 10 to the minus two. So 10 to the minus two megabytes. That should be my answer. Okay. Is it clear? Uh, let's review a little bit of powers, how to, uh, how to divide powers. 10 to the four divided by 10 to the six. The six goes up, but with the, with the opposite sign, right? 10 to the minus six. And then if I multiply powers, right? I have to add or subtract. In this case, I'm subtracting because I have four to the minus six. Four minus six minus two. But 10 to the minus two is equal to say 0 0.01. Okay? So I would say like 10 to the minus two megabytes or 0 0.01 megabytes. Okay? So those two things are exactly the same, that equivalent. Okay. So again, uh, more problems. I will do more problems on the on the other videos. So don't worry about the the doing this particular problems. Okay, so now, something happened with my, sharing the screen, let me, Right. Okay, so those are for the smaller, right? For the smaller units. Here, a, a digit must be estimated is called uncertain. Okay, so now what happened with measurements? So in some cases, the measurements, right? Uh, we use now everybody, everything is digital, but in the lab range, in the lab scale, we are using some, in some cases, some instruments, for example, the metric, the metric uh, tape, or the volumetric, uh, a graduate cylinder, a pipette. So normally this particular uh, instruments or tools, they have some precision, right? So you cannot just, uh, as I'm gonna show right now, my, I'm gonna stop the sharing. So for example here, what you can clearly see here, I have a ruler with centimeters. One, two, three, four, five. So I can see centimeters. So Every any of every of these big lines right here is a centimeter. Right? You can see right there. So here. 
also centimeter. But this centimeter has also smaller lines, which are called the millimeters, right? Can I go smaller than millimeters? No, here I would say like centimeters, and each of these guys is millimeters, okay? So can I go some, somewhere smaller? No, so that's the limitation of this ruler. This ruler allows me only to measure up to the millimeters, okay? So if I, for example, want to measure something, the maximum I can measure here is five point, let's say like 5.5 millimeters, okay? So mm. Why? Because this one, like, uh, sorry, centimeters. Okay. Why? Because I have the five, right? So let's say in this case it's 13, but let's say like I have the millimeter, right, the centimeters, and then I can go one decimal place. Okay. So that's why I have that. But let's say like this particular case, in this particular line, if you see this line, okay, so that's the beginning and that's the end. So if you look at the end closely, hopefully I can, I can go very close. Okay. If you look at the, at, the, at the ruler, right? So the line doesn't really go to the, to the point, right? You would say like, okay, so this one should measure four point, right? It's four point, then I have one, I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. But it's really not falling exactly on eight. It is a little bit more, right? It's, it's, it's between eight and nine, but it's closer to eight, but it's, a it's slightly more. Then that is what we call, for me, it is 81. So what is the name of this thing? This one is my approximation. This value, that particular number is my uncertain or estimated digit, is my uncertainty. Okay. So that is called the estimated digit. Okay. So I'm gonna go back. So is, it is what we call the estimated digit. Every instrument has that, right? Well, except the, the clock, right? A, a clock doesn't have that because the clock gives you directly the number. But in those particular measurements where you have to use your eyes to, to measure something, then in that case, you will have the uncertainty that is coming from the estimated digit. The estimated digit is that number that you have to add. Do I always have to add it? What if I just report 4.8? No, because by saying that you're reporting 4.8, you're trying to say that eight is your estimated digit, which is not true because this ruler allows you to go to the millimeter range. By this, by saying this, you're trying to say that you're going only to the centimeter range, but no. So here I will have to report 4.81 in my case. Oh, what about if my eye says 4.81, but maybe a student, another student says like, oh, to me it looks like a 4.82 and somebody else 4.83. Yes, that number can be different. 4.81, 4.82, 4.83. That's why we say that this one is uncertainty because for somebody can be 0.1, for somebody else 0.2, for somebody else 0.3. So that last digit is the one that is different. So that's why we call this one the estimated estimated digit. But these ones are certain. These are certain values. This one is the one that is uncertain. Okay, so anytime that you guys are measuring something, always, I mean, they are using your eyes, right? So if you have something digital, uh, for example, the temperature, Normally temperature right now, all the thermometers, they come with a, they come with a digital screen. So you can just read, read it, read it off the, the instrument. But in the case, like for example, measuring volume, as we will see later um, on the next slide. Okay, for example, here, here is, uh, they're trying to measure the volume uh, from a burette. And then you can see here that the, the burette goes from 20 to 21. 
right? And then from 20 to 21, right, right there. So I want to know each line is 10, right? In this case, it's milli, milliliters. So what happens after milliliters? Well, I have 20, 20.1, 20 and then 20.2. But my liquid is not a point, it's right in between, right? So it's not point 20.10, 20.20. It is kind of in between. So that's why here, um, we said that the, for example, we are reporting 20.15 because it goes right in between. And I wanna take advantage of this slide also to mention what is the meniscus. You guys are gonna do that on the first lab, right? So for the, to measure the volume. But the meniscus is a phenomenon that happens to liquids. That is, that is caused by gravity. The gravity causes this curve here on the liquids. The, the more, the narrower is the container, the stronger you will see the, uh, the more you will see the effect, right? Because it will definitely, well, it, it depends on the, on the liquid really, but you will always see a curve. So when you measure a, a volume or a liquid, right, the volume of a liquid, you don't never do the top, you never do the, you, you never do the, I mean, the top or the intermediate. You always have to read the liquid at the really, at the curve, the, the bottom of that curve. So that is called the meniscus of the liquid, right? So in this case, it's right in between, since it's right in between, that's why they are reporting as 20.15. 20 point, 20 point so my certain digits are 20.1 because that's what the instrument, right? This particular burette is allowing me to measure 20 millimeters, right? 20 milliliters plus the line. But the certain digit is the, the last five because that comes from my eye, my appreciation, my own determination says to uh, is, is, is a pi at the very end. Okay, so now, <clears throat> What happened with my values? I mean, like, okay, so we said at the beginning that that estimated digit might cause some discrepancies, right? So that for uh, somebody might see that as a 0 0.5, somebody might see it as a 0 0.7, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, point there. But there is uh, two terms that are very important to remember at this point, is precision and accuracy. Accuracy is the agreement between with the, of your measurements with a true value. For example, let's say like, you have to target, let's say like this particular water, right? The water has a density of one gram per milliliter. That is the true value for, for, for the density of water. So if you obtain 0 0.8, that means that you're not accurate, right? Because you're very far from the, from the true value. Well, no precision, precision is the agreement of your measurements, whatever you like, for example, normally whenever you do experiments, you never do only one trial, you do three, four, five trials. So if these trials are close in value, then that means that your measurements are precise. Your measurement is precise. Whatever you are doing is precise. It's better to explain by using this graph. For example, in this particular case, the, the board A, this one, this particular case, it is really unprecise and also inaccurate because you have a scattered values. The, all, your, all your values are really scattered, up, down, left, right. Here, in this particular case, I would say that for case B is that my measurement is precise, okay? Why precise? Because all my, my trials, they have very close values. It's precise. Is it accurate? No, because you are not hitting the target. The point is to hit the target. You are not hitting the target. So what could be causing this problem? Well, maybe your instrument is not calibrated or you are doing, it, you are doing something wrong and apparently your mistake is reproducible, so which is good. I mean, that, that at least is, is a mistake from the instrument, most likely. Or maybe the temperature at which you are doing the measurement is not the one that you are supposed to. Okay? So that, those are things, uh, those are things that, uh, that they, um, you can overcome um, during your experiments. And in the last case, you have here that your measurement is precise because you can see that all your trials are the same and also accurate okay? because you are hitting the target. You're very close to the, to the target. That's the difference between precision and accuracy. Now let's go to significant figures. Remember that at the beginning we said, well, earlier in the previous slides, we were saying that you have estimated digits, right? So you're adding a digit that is really not part of your, of your measurement. Then 
what should I consider to be significant or not? So whenever you see, a, 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 whenever somebody reports a, a value for a measurement, sometimes you have to multiply, you have to add, you have to report these measurements, right? For example, the surface, uh, the area of a notebook, right? Let's say like the cover of your, of your book, you want to see the area. So you know that for area, you have to multiply, right? Side by side, right? L times L. So that's how you get the area. So you have to multiply, let's say like 5.5 times 10.5555. So I'm multiplying something with one decimal place times something that has four decimal places. So my final answer, how many decimal places should I consider? Well, that, call, that goes under the umbrella of significant figures. Right? So normally it's, uh, they abbreviate a sig fix. They normally call it sig fix or SFs. Yep. So in this case, we will have to determine how many sig fix a particular uh, value has. So for example, if you have non-zero numbers, like right? non-zero in integer um, numbers, they are all significant. Three, four, five, three, four, five, six, four sig fix. Yep. So what about the zeros? The zeros are the problem. Yep. So if you have what we call leading zeros. Leading zeros are the zeros that are in front of, of non-zero numbers. For example, these are leading zeros. Other cases of leading zero will be zero point, I cannot really write with the mouse here, but zero point zero 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 one, let's say. In this case, I have only one sig fig. Why one sig fig? Because these are all leading zeros. So they are not significant. So it's only one sig fig. This one, these are leading zeros. So that's why 48 has two sig figs. Okay. Okay, so in the case of sig fix, uh, it's basically the zeros are the problem. Okay, so in this case, captive zeros or what we call sandwich uh, zeros. So you have a zero in between, right in the middle. So what should I do with zeros that are in the middle? They count, they are significant. In this case, I would say like one, two, three, four sig fix. Okay, in the case that we have uh, trailing zeros, the zeros that are at the end, so they are not significant. Okay, so the only zeros that are significant are the ones that have uh, are between uh, non-zero digits, and also the ones that are after a decimal place. Yeah, that's also coming later. After a decimal place, we have also the they're also significant. Okay? So trailing zeros are not. Uh, so trailing zeros are not significant. For example, here 150. 150 has only two sig fix. This is significant. This is significant. This is not significant. In this case, 9.3. So here you have uh, four sig fix. Why? Because here you have significant, significant. These zeros are trailing zeros. Yes, they're trailing zeros, but they are after a decimal place. If they're after a decimal place, they are significant. Okay. In what case are you, it is not significant? For example, if I have 1,000, if I have 1,000, right? One, zero, zero, zero. So in this case, I have only one sig fig because these are trailing zeros and they are not decimal. Right? So uh, zeros that are not decimal and are trailing, they are not significant. Right? But in this case, they are trailing, but they are decimal. So they count as, as, as significant. Okay. Again, more of this uh, of these particular uh, examples, we will do it in the in the solve problems on YouTube. Uh, that will be posted on YouTube, and then we will put the link on on Blackboard. Exact numbers. Exact numbers are, is a different story. Uh, remember that before we were using the conversion factors to go from um, from milli, milligrams to grams. Those are exact numbers. Those exact numbers don't have significant figures. They have infinite number of significant figures. So uh, in this case, one inch is equal to 2.54 centimeter. Would you say that this one has three sig figs? In the context of this conversion or this equivalency, no. They don't have sig figs. They have an infinite number of sig figs. Nine pencils, for example. Do I say that this nine pencils is, uh, is uh, one sig fig? No. Because a pencil is is a number, is a count, right? It's an account. Is you, you get it from counting. 
it is not like saying like, oh, the weight of this is 5.5 grams. That's a measurement. It's not an exact number. It's a measured number. These are exact numbers, right? You don't get 5.5 grams by counting, right? So you have to get the weight or something and then to determine the, the mass of something. Okay? Exponential notation or what we call scientific notation is when you express something as powers. Okay? So for example, 300, in this case, 300 decimal place, okay? So this decimal place is very important. Okay? So because here it's telling you that this uh, three, uh, those zeros are, um, are significant. Okay? So, Oh, well, then what is the difference between the previous example that you gave us, right? So here I say like this 1000, right, has only, has only one sig fig, because in this case, I'm only writing 1000. I'm not writing the, the, the decimal place next to it. For example, if I say 1000 period, that's different. Now I have four sig figs. Okay, I want to be clear with this four sig figs. Here, only one sig fig. What makes the difference? The decimal place? Yes, the decimal place is the one that makes the difference. Okay? So here is that decimal place, that decimal, decimal uh, point, right? What makes the difference between one and the other, the other type of number? In this case, um, Right, I have the 300 period, right, point, then that means that it has to be written 3.00 3 uh, times that 10 to the 2. Uh, the 10 to the 2 is coming by running the decimal place, right? So one time, two times. That's why I have the, I have the, the power to the 2, 3 sig figs. Two advantages of writing exponential or scientific notation is that you can definitely see the number of significant figures. Yes, it is a better way how to read uh, significant figures by using exponential notation. And then fewer zeros are added. Yeah, for example, if you want to write $1 billion, right? You normally don't want to write $1 billion. You want to write one, uh, uh, 10 to the mind, I mean, 1 million, let's say 1 million, 10 to the six, right? Then to the six would be the, the conversion for one million. million. Now, what happens if, we, if I want to multiply, divide, add, subtract? So there are different rules for dividing and subtracting significant figures. For example, you want to multiply something, right? So I want to mul multiply two measured numbers. I'm, I'm assuming that these are measured numbers. 1.342 times 5.5. The calculator, right, gives me 7.6. 7.381. How many decimal places should I keep, right? Should I keep one decimal place? Should I keep three decimal places or something in between or all of them, right? In this case, you only keep a one decimal place. Why one decimal place? Because you have to determine how many sig figs. How many sig figs are here? Here we have two sig figs. What about in the other number? The other number has four sig figs, right? So here I have four sig figs. Okay, four. What are the four? One, two, three, four, right? Four sig figs. Here I have two sig figs. So your result should have the lowest number of sig figs. Okay, so here I have two sig figs, so my, my, my result should have also two sig figs. Okay, so let's say, let's do some other examples here on my, my okay? So using sig figs, nothing better than writing. I mean, you have no idea how much, how much I miss my board. Okay, so in this case, sig figs, let's say like I'm trying to multiply 3.715 grams, right? Times, um, let's say like, no, normally it is, let's use area centimeters times 5.7975 centimeters, okay? So if I use my calculator, 3.715 times 5.7975, I get out from the calculator 21.537725. okay? That's what I get from the calculator. Should I report all this? 
Definitely not, right? So how many sig figs do I have here? I have four sig figs. How many sig figs do I have here? One, two, three, four, five, five sig figs. So I use the four sig figs, right? My lowest, my lowest number of sig figs. So here I have to have only four sig figs. One, two, three, four. Cut it here. Okay? So by cutting it, remember that you have to round it, right? So if you drop it because it's four sig figs only, right? Four sig figs, one, two, three, four. So after that, then you have to make sure. So if I'm dropping, should I round it? Yes, because this guy is greater or equal Right? Seven is greater or equal than five. So uh, then I round it 21.54 centimeters square, square centimeters. And so that would be the, 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 my result 21.54 with the right number of significant figures. Four sig figs, four sig figs. What happened with the five sig figs? You lose the sig figs? Yes, you lose that sig fig. But your result has to report always the lowest, the lowest number of sig figs that. Are, are in okay so what happens with with addition and subtraction well in case of addition and subtraction we have we keep the same number of decimal places as the least precise number precise measure number right so in this case, I'm adding something that has three decimal places with something that has two decimal places. If you are adding those two numbers, then you have to write your answer as only something that has two decimal places. So here is really not, it's not about sig figs, it's about number of decimal places. Okay? Multiplication, division, in that case you use sig figs, but for addition and subtraction, you don't use sig figs. Okay? So, Let's do some more example here, maybe I can. Okay, so let's do something else. Uh, let's say I have 10.072, right? Times 0 0.0702, okay. Is equal to what? Right? So that's gonna be my first example. Okay, so in this case, 10.072 times 0 0.0702. Okay, so I have my calculator says that my answer should be written as 0 0.7070544. That's what my calculator says. Okay, so now how many sig figs should I keep? Okay, count number of sig figs here. One, two, three, four, five, five sig figs. Okay, what about here? These are leading zeros, they don't. This counts, this counts, this counts. Okay, so uh, I will use that as a practice. Why is it not, this is not significant because this is a leading zero. This is a leading zero, okay? Uh, leading zeros are always not significant, okay? So, non-zero non number is always significant. This one is a captive zero, right? It's a sandwich zero, so it's significant. One, two, three, so three sig figs. What about here? These zeros are captive, right? Are between non-zero digits, therefore they are all significant. Five sig figs, okay? You say like, oh, well, what happened with the first rule that you said that whenever you have, a, let's say like a zero, right? That is, that is decimal is always significant. Yes, a zero that is decimal is always significant as long as it's not leading zero. Okay, that is the problem with this. Like, so, that, sorry, that, that is the problem with this because why is this not significant if this thing is a decimal? Yes, but it is a leading zero. If it's a leading zero, leading zeros are never significant. Okay? So keep that in mind. I mean, that particular difference, like all zeros that are decimals are significant, not always. If they are like leading zeros, they are not significant. Okay, so here I have five sig figs, three sig figs. That means that this one, I have to shorten it to three sig figs. Okay? So um, this one is not, so one, two, three. I cut it here. This zero is not, greater or equal to five is a zero. So my reported number is gonna be seven. 
that will be my, my answer, okay? Because I need to have three sig figs. Now let's add it, right? So let's do like 12.721 plus 5.1. So now this example I need to add. Well, if you are adding one, two, eight, seven, one, right? That would be my answer from the calculator, right? But in this case, I need to have only one decimal place, one dp. So my answer should have also only one dp. So it would be 17.8. Okay? Drop it, drop this, drop this. Should I also round it for in this case? Yes, you also round it. But in this case, two is not greater or equal to five, then I don't round it, 17.8. Only one dp, only one decimal place should be kept for my final answer, all right? So again, uh, I will do more problems definitely in, the, in my YouTube videos. Good, so dimensional analysis, this one is conversion, that's gonna be full practice. So I'll just go, gonna go briefly over this, uh, the dimensional analysis part. Um, we're gonna use the conversion factor, right? So now that we know sig fix, definitely we have to use sig fix. Uh, you're gonna be converting one, one unit into the other, uh, other unit. So in this case, it says that a golfer put a, padded, um, a golf ball, right? 6.8 uh, feet across a green. How many inches does that represent? Okay, so let's let's do that. It's better do it by hand. Okay, so it is according to this problem. It says like 6.8 foot feet, right? So into inches. Okay, so the problem says like 6.8 uh, foot into inches. We have the, the conversion factor is uh, one foot is equal to 12 inches. Okay. I need to do this conversion. Then I have to come up with a conversion factor. One foot divided by 12 inches, or I could say like 12 inches, one foot. Right? So those are my two potential conversion factors. So in this particular case, 6.8 foot, right? Times here comes the conversion factor. I want to cancel out the foot, so I have to use this conversion factor. 12 inches, uh, one foot. Cancel out, cancel out. According to my calculator, 6.8 times 12, 81.6 inches. Now, I'm doing a calculation. What am I doing here? I'm multiplying. So how many sig figs should I consider here? Well, I have to see the sig figs here. So how many sig figs here? I have two sig figs. Do I use the sig figs of the conversion factor? No. Here, don't use sig fix, no sig fix. No, why? Because this one is an exact number. Exact numbers don't have sig fix. Then you always have to use the two sig fix. Conversion factors, never use it for, for sig fix uh, determination. So in this case, two sig fix, this guy, I have to reduce it to 82 inches because that is two sig figs. This one has three sig figs, right? We all agree that this one is three sig figs. So you want to reduce it to two sig figs. So it should be only 82. Why? Because I cut it here. And then this six adds to the 81. So I round it off to 80, 82. Good. So here again, uh, we will do more of this uh, for the solve problems. Okay. Here is the, should give you the answer, 82 inches, right? 82 inches is the, the final answer because it has to have two sig figs. Here there are more examples. I mean, you guys can go over that uh, with, the, with, the, with the PowerPoint. Okay. So temperature is another unit or another, uh, sorry, it's another type of measurement that we're gonna be doing. We have uh, three, three systems, three scales, Fahrenheit, Celsius, and Kelvin. They have different, different system. I mean, why is that? Normally, uh, water, uh, the Celsius rate uses the, the boil of water as the division, right? So freezing point is zero, boiling point is 100. So it's a centi-degree, right? Centi-degree uh, scale. In Celsius, no. I think that's, I heard that Celsius, if I don't remember wrongly, uh, is they use alcohol, ethanol. For the range, for the boiling and the and the boiling and the, the freezing, okay. 
and Kelvin is the absolute temperature. In, in science, in chemistry, you guys are going to be using uh, temp, uh, Kelvin a lot. These are the conversion formulas. That one definitely uh, you will have it at all times available. So this one is how to go from Kelvin to Celsius. This one is how to go to right, from Celsius to Fahrenheit, like how to play between the two, the two units. Uh, this is how to do the Celsius to Kelvin. There is one thing that uh, that is very important that there is no formula that allows you to go from Fahrenheit directly to Kelvin. Okay? So that's always something that I always wonder. Like, I mean, everybody really wonders why. There is no way how to convert directly Fahrenheit to Kelvin or Kelvin to Fahrenheit. To go to from Fahrenheit to Kelvin, First, you have to go to Celsius, and from Celsius, you can go to Kelvin. But you cannot, uh, you cannot just go directly. You have to convert one person to the Celsius and then go to the other, to the other unit, okay? Density, density is a property, it's basically a property, it's a physical property of the substance. It applies for, really, you can get this density of solids, liquids, and gases, but it's mostly used for liquids. So, mass of a substance per unit volume of the substance. The normal units are grams per cubic centimeter. Uh, cubic centimeter is equal to, say, milliliters, okay, by the way. This one is an equivalence. So, grams per milliliter. That's for liquids, but for gases, no. In gases, we use normally grams per liter. Okay? So, in, in gases, okay, so write that down, in gases, because gases are so light that one milliliter has no weight. So for gases, normally we use grams per liter. But for liquids, yes, grams per milliliter. For example, for water, the density is one gram per milliliter. So by definition, density is equal to mass over volume, or is uh, D is equal to M over D. So oh, this, uh, so it's not this D. It should be the D, the small, the small D, the small D. Yeah, the lower case, the lower case D. It's important because it's not the same thing D. Uh, because D, the in uppercase uh, is dipole moment. Uh, that's something that's coming later in the course. Same thing with B. A small V, the lower case V is velocity, and the uppercase uh, V is volume. And so. Same thing with mass. The small case M is mass. Uppercase M is molarity, which we are also going to learn later on. Okay. Here, a certain mineral has a mass of 18 grams. Okay, so we're going we're gonna to do this example. It's 17.8 8 grams and a volume of 2.35 centimeters. What is the density of the mineral? Okay, so that is the mass. And this is the volume, okay? 18, 17.8 uh, grams, and then 2.35 uh, milliliters or centi cubic centimeters. By definition, density is equal to mass over volume. So density is equal to mass. My mass is 17.8 grams divided by the volume, 2.35 cubic centimeters. Uh, I don't cancel out anything because they are not the same thing. So uh, 17.8 divided by 2.35. Uh, the calculator throws a huge number, 7.574468, blah, blah, blah. Makes a lot of, a lot of units. So should I keep that big number? No, you have to use sig fix. Okay? In this case, they are not exact numbers. They are both measurements, mass and volume. So they have sig fix. So, 17.8 has three sig figs, right? 2.35 also has three sig figs, okay? So they both agree. So I should keep only three sig figs. One, two, three, okay? So the, the previous one, right, the next one is less, is, is smaller than five, then I don't round it. 5.57 grams per cubic centimeter, okay? Now that I'm doing this, I wanna be, I would, I would like to write an example. What if I do this? And they tell me round this to three sig figs, okay? 
if I run these two tricks in fix, I would say like one, two, three. I cut it here. This four is is not is not greater than five, greater or equal than five. But somebody might ask, like, okay, what about if I round this? I get a five. And now this one round this. Can I do this chain rounding? No. When you do these uh, significant figures, you always look only at the immediate neighbor. Don't look at the, even if you have here nine, 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 you have here trace of nine, a trail of nines, that doesn't affect it. The four is the one that counts, okay? So never use the previous numbers. Don't start rounding, rounding, rounding until you get to your, to your limit. No, always only look at the at the immediate number if you want to do your your approximation. Okay, so our density should be seven point fifty seven. Right, the same thing as we said, like two uh, three significant figures. Here is more examples. Again, I'll, I'll do plenty of examples for density. Classification of matter, we have that anything that occupies a space and has a mass is considered to be a matter. Um, matter is in three different states, solid, liquid, and gases. Um, here you can see this one is the best representation of matter that you will see. In, in solid state, you will have a specific structure. It's a perfect crystal. Some crystals are, are, are I mean, they're like, amorphous crystals, they are very symmetrical crystals, but there is an organization that is perfect, almost perfect. For example, glass is not perfect, but for example, sodium chloride is, a, is an excellent organization. Okay? So here you will have that it's so perfect that it's a net of the, of the particles that is, makes it very crowded that, that the solid has a high, really, it's a high organization. In liquid, no. Liquid is kind of flexible, right? So that's why liquid flows, because it has some flexibility. There is some interspatial, um, interspace between the molecules, right? So there is some space, flexibility. They are really not connected directly. See, there is like, there is here some special spaces, empty spaces that are between the molecules. And in the case of gases, absolutely. I mean, the gases are the most dispersed, right? That's why they are so light, because they are mostly empty. Here there is nothing. Here there is all empty. Okay? So this one is the best representation for the three states of the matter. There is a fourth state of the matter, which is called the plasma. Plasma is here. Let's say like here will be in this, this particular side. Plasma, that will also be like a nice discussion board to, to complete for plasma. But plasma is, uh, is closer to the gas state, right? the gas state of the matter, but it has a high energy in, the, in, in which the electrons are excited to, a, to, a, to such a high energy that, that it behaves, it has different properties than the, than the regular gas phase. Right? So it's really the energy what gives that particular state a different characteristic. Okay? Do we see that easily here at, at room temperature on the right on, on, on Earth uh, at sea level? Let's say um, no. I mean you have to apply a lot of heat, a lot of electricity. You have to apply basically you have to excite the electrons the as much as you can, so it gets the plasma state. Solid, um, just going over the characteristics. I mean the specifics. Uh, it's rigid, has fixed volume and shape. Um, the liquid has a uh, definite uh, volume, but no specific shape, right? So for example, if I put a glass of water right, in a bottle that is a square, well, bottles are not a square, but in a, in a square uh, container, it will, the liquid has a square shape. If I put in a cylinder, in a balloon, right, it will have a spherical shape. So it always assumes the shape of the container. In the case of gas, no fixed volume and no fixed shape. You can always compress the gas. You can do whatever you do with the gases because there is so much space in, uh, between those molecules that you can do whatever you want with it. it. Takes on the shape of the volume and the container. Okay. So now classification of the matter. Matter can be classified into, I mean, different ways, right? So matter you can classify matter as the depending on the states, right? On the if you have um, uh, solid, liquid, or gas, or plasma, right? But also depending on the composition. So depending on the composition, uh, a matter can be called uh, a homogene, uh, <clears throat> a pure substance. Let's, let's, let's do that here. Okay. 
matter. Okay. Can be classified by state. Right? The state of the matter. In the state of the matter, you can have uh, solid, liquid, and gas. Right? That's one type of classifier. Then, depending on the composition, the composition is a different type of classification. In that case, you will have a pure substance. Or you can have a mixture. Okay, now that's based on the composition. That's a different from this type, right? So composition. Now pure substance can also be divided into another types. You can have uh, element and compound. Elements and compounds. And in the case of mixture, you can have what we call homogeneous mixture. homogeneous mixture and heterogeneous mixture. Okay, that's, that's the two types. What is an element? Element is whatever it has one, only one type of atom. Let's say if I have a, a bar of pure silver, okay? If I have a bar of pure silver, which symbol is AG, would be a good idea to start getting familiar with the elements, the, uh, the symbols, AG, that means that I only have AGs here. AG, AG, AG only. If that is AG only, then I call that an element. Okay? What about a compound? A compound, let's say that if I have a tube of ice, tube of ice is water, right? Water, water, water. Do I have only one type of element? No. Here I have hydrogen and I also have oxygen. So I have two elements, but they are the same entity, right? The same, it's the same particle, right? It's only one. Yeah, it's only that here you call it compound because it is is a is a one single type of matter, but it's made up of different atoms. Right? So in the case of element, is one type of matter, right? Made of the same type of element, a compound. Is the same is, is is one type of matter but with different elements yep. so this one is the type of matter but it has different elements inside here one single type of matter but it's the same element inside yep. so that's the difference between between an element and a compound yep. so here example for that pure silver pure gold pure uh, carbon in this case this graphite that I'm using for writing and my pencil that is graphite, that's pure carbon. Diamond is also pure carbon. Okay? Um, compound, in the case of compound, I have water. What else, carbon dioxide, right? Whatever we exhale, normally after respiration, that's carbon dioxide, CO2. What else, uh, glucose, C4H12O6, that's glucose, uh, that's also another compound, right? What else is a compound? Uh, Mm, let's let me think. Oh, chalk. Chalk is calcium carbonate. Calcium carbonate is also C C A C O three. So it's only one type of matter, but it has different elements. Here I have calcium. Here I have carbon. I have oxygen. Here I have carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. Carbon and oxygen, right? Or oh, another type of uh, silicon dioxide, sand. One of the main components of sun is silicon dioxide, SiO2. So I have here different type of elements. Right? So that makes it a compound. Another one for compound, uh, for element, uh, oxygen, oxygen gas is an element. Right? Oh, but you have here more than one atom. Yes, but it's the same atom. Remember, it has to be the same type of atom, same type of atom. Here, I don't have the same type of atoms. So it doesn't matter if it's O2. Nitrogen is also a single type of atom. Uh, here is carbon graphite, but diamond is also, right? Diamond, carbon diamond, that's also uh, an element. What happens in, in mixture? In mixture, I don't have, I have more than one type of matter. Pure substance, only one type of matter. Mixture, 
more than one type of matter, okay? So in this case, a homogeneous mixture is when I dissolve, let's say, water plus salt, okay? You dissolve water in salt, you dissolve it in a beaker or in a, in a glass, and then you will see only one thing. Okay? That's homogeneous. What about heterogeneous, water and sand? If you mix water and sand, you will mix it, but as we know, the sand doesn't dissolve. So you will see the water and the sand will be at the bottom. So in this case, it is a, it's, it's one type of, it's more than one type of matter, yes, because here I have the salt and I also have the water. It's that I cannot see it, but you can taste it, right? Here, you can see it. I mean, with naked eye, you can see the number of particles, number of types of matter that you have. What if on top of this, I add stones? Yeah, that would be a three, three component mixture. This one is a two component mixture, two component homogeneous mixture. This one is a three component heterogeneous mixture, right? So let's go back to the slide, we're close to the end. Okay. So in the case of a homogeneous mixture, we have a visible, right? It's a, it's a visible um, component, right? So in solution, um, okay. So in this case, which one is a homogeneous mixture? Pure, wa pure water. No, pure water, no, it's not a mixture because it's only H2O, right? Because it says pure water. What about tap water? What do you guys think about tap water? Well, tap water, remember, it has many salts inside, right? So I would say it will be a homogeneous mixture, but in this case, they're telling me pure water. So pure water is not. How, how would I classify pure water? I would classify pure water as a compound, right? Gasoline, gasoline actually that is, that's what I would say. This one is my homogeneous mixture. Gasoline is a mixture of hydrocarbons. Hydrocarbons are normally these, um, these chemicals, organic compounds that, that come from the, from the crude oil, right? Um, gasoline is a mixture of components. We have inside hexane, ectane, uh, octane, heptane, different type of compounds that are inside. Jar of jelly, beans, jelly beans, uh, I would say that they are heterogeneous mixture, right? I mean, they are not the same, they're not the same. So for example, one is red, one is blue, one is white, one is purple. So they have, definitely they are, they are different. They're not the same thing. Soil, no, that's heterogeneous because if you give me some soil, I'm sure that I will see some pieces of stone, maybe some sand, I will see also soil, right? So I will see different, even pieces of glass, right? I might see even in soil, so that would be a heterogeneous mixture. Copper metal, no, copper metal, if it's pure copper metal, it would be only copper, that would qualify as an element, right? What, what if the copper is not pure? Well, then it would be a homogeneous mixture. Right? Because you will have, let's say, copper. Uh, normally, if you dissolve copper with zinc, uh, you produce an alloy, right? Which is the bronze, right? Bronze is the, no, no. With zinc would be brass, yeah. Copper with tin is bronze. Copper, if you mix that with tin, SN, right? Then you get bronze. But if you mix it with zinc, it will be brass. Okay? So different types. I mean, if you see a, a bar of brass or, 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 or bronze, right? So you cannot see it. You cannot say, oh, here I see the copper, here I see the tin, here I see the zinc. No, because they're all mixed up. So they're all, if they are mixed up in a very homogeneous form with hom homogeneity, then it is a homogeneous mixture. But if I have half of the bar zinc and the other half of the bars uh, copper, yeah, I would say it's a homo, it's a heterogeneous mixture. Okay? In this case, gasoline is the. Okay, and then the very last part of this, uh, the last section for this particular chapter, it is about the changes that matter undergoes. We have a physical change and also we have the chemical change. In a physical change, we change the form of the substance, but not the chemical composition. Okay, in this physical change, we are not breaking bonds. All what we're doing is separating or changing the state of the substance, right, of the, of the type of matter, but we are not 
transforming anything, right? For example, if I have my hair, right? So if my hair, right, um, let's say like right now is long. <clears throat> if I cut it, hair at the beginning, hair at the end, right? Nothing. What about a piece of, a piece of ice if I let it melt? That process is a physical change. Why? Because I have water at the beginning, water at the end. What is the difference? That in one case was water liquid, the other is water solid. Right? So those, those changes in, in the state, they're only, they're only physical change. Cutting, for example, cutting, uh, filtrating, filtration, distillation, those are all physical changes. You don't change the nature of the substance. So, for example, if I'm mixing, what about if I mix sand and, 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 and stones and rocks? That would be a physical change, right? Because I have a pure sand in the beginning and then I have sand mixed with stones, but they are not reacting. They are only mixed. In a chemical change, that, that's different. So, in this case, you create a new substance. That's what makes the big difference between the two. It's a new substance that's created. You normally, you cannot go back. To the starting point. For example, what happens if I burn a, uh, a piece of uh, paper? If you burn a piece of paper, what you get is ashes. No matter what you do to those ashes, you are never going to go back to your original piece of paper. Right? So normally burning is one way. Bleaching is another way that you cannot go back. Right. So for example, by accident, you put some bleach on your uh, blue, blue shirt, that stain is not going to, it's not going to disappear. Uh, even if you wash in a lot of detergent, it's a chemical change. Okay? So what about Alka-Seltzer? If you dissolve, I have a, a tablet of Alka-Seltzer of Tums, and I dissolve it in water. Okay, I dissolve it in water. The first thing you're going to see is bubbles, right? It will start bubbling. You are producing a new substance. If you're producing a new substance, definitely that is a chemical change. Okay? There are different evidences, right? As, as I said, a chemical change. There is a color change. Gas product, uh, you produce gas and the formation of a precipitate. Okay? So, those are the things that are normally associated with chemical change. So, this one is a, it's a, it's a, it's the best way, right? Exactly what I showed you uh, before classification of the matter depending on the composition, right? So, mixtures, substances, right? Pure substances, then you have elements, you have compounds, right? So, chemical methods, you go from compound to element. Yes, correct. You do a chemical change here. So heterogeneous, homogeneous, yeah, here, to, if you have to separate them, you will have to do it through physical, physical changes. Okay, so, well, this is just examples. How many following a chemical change? Crushing rock salt. If you are crushing, no, you are just changing the state of the rock salt. So that is not, this is not a chemical change. What about burning wood? Burning, definitely because you get ashes. Ashes is not the same thing as wood. Dissolving sugar in water, no. Because you, all what you are doing there is just putting the sugar inside of the water. You're not burning it, you're not breaking it, you're not producing gas, you're not having a color change, you're not producing a new solid. It's not, it's not chemical. Melting a popsicle on a warm summer day. Melting anything that involves change of the state, it is a physical change. Eh? So. Uh, it's a physical change, so no. It should be burning wood, yes. Okay, so something else, I mean, uh, it is not part of the, it's not part of the, of the, of the slides, but definitely I wanted to share this with you, the changes of the state of the matter. I don't know why it's not part of the chapter, but, but definitely. Uh, the state transitions, so we have solid, we have liquid and we have gas, right? The transition from solid to liquid is called melting. The transition from liquid to gas is called vaporization or evaporation. Okay, the transition from gas to liquid is called condensation. And the transition from liquid to solid is called freezing. Okay, so let's be clear with all these transitions. So is there any way how I can go from solid to gas? Yes, 
that transition is called sublimation. Sublimation, something sublime, right? For example, dry ice. Dry ice is a, is a, is a, is a compound, is carbon dioxide, um, that you have a cube of, of dry ice, normally they come in rods, but uh, you have a cube of rod of dry ice, you will see that it will evaporate. It, 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 that term evaporates is wrong. It would, you, you would say like it sublimes, it's subliming. Okay? So the, the dry ice is a, is a, normally let's say, it's a, let's say it's a cube, right? It will go directly, directly to the gas phase. It doesn't make a puddle, there is no liquid. There's no liquid before the, the formation of the gas. That's why they call it dry ice because they don't, it doesn't form any liquid. What about the opposite, right? So this is sublimation this way and this way, right? The bottom would be deposition from gas to solid. Okay? So that would be the whole, the whole idea, the whole picture for the change of the state of the matter. Melting, vaporization or evaporation, condensation, freezing, then sublimation this way, and then deposition the other way, okay? And with this, I'm finishing with this chapter one. Uh, let's get together again for chapter two. I'll talk to you guys soon.